Who enjoys vicarious experiences? Seeing life through the eyes of another. Have any of you ever been to a movie? <laughs> Raise your hand. See, everybody's hand should be up. It's why we go to movies. It's why we watch television. It's why we read books. To have a vicarious experience. To have an experience that we didn't have. Some experiences that maybe we wouldn't want to have. A vicarious experience is simply sharing the story of another. Because this is what we're doing. We are creating stories. I think it's as simple as that. We are creating the stories of our dreams, each and every one of us. So, I think on some level, everybody here agrees that you do like vicarious experiences. So, <clears throat> we're gonna do that now. Picture yourself. You are 1,600 feet in the air, clinging to the side of a sheer granite wall. 90 degrees, straight up and down. No ropes, no nets, no parachutes. The only external tool you have, rubber shoes. You, are you there? You picture it? <laughs> well, that's the position you can now assume with Alex Honnold. When about six pounds, Alex grabbed a tiny piece of rock and pulled himself up. So how many of you think that Alex Honnold is some kind of adrenaline junkie, that, he, that he's serving a need for some kind of inner fix, how many? <laughs> Laura Logan, the 60 Minutes correspondent who interviewed him, asked him this question. She said, uh, do you ever feel the adrenaline? And he said, if I feel, he said, first he said, no. And he said, if I ever feel a rush, that means something terribly wrong has happened. He said, it should be slow. It should be peaceful. He said, for me, it's mellow. No adrenaline. So, before taking his first hand hold, making his first foothold, where do you think Alex pictures himself? Yeah, on top of that mountain. It's complete. It's already done. It's an accomplished fact up here. And if it was not he wouldn't dream of taking that first step. There was a point in this interview where, uh, where he, he gets up about the, the, first, the first half of Sentinel. And, and he's, he's positioning himself. There are a number of handholds, and you can kind of see these hand, hand and footholds. And he's moving toward the crevice that you saw him climbing up. And he had to take a long step to get into the crevice. And the gentleman that was with Laura Logan was a mountaineering expert. He did, a, he did a lot of this kind of stuff in his younger years. And once he stepped into that crevice, he said, Alex has now moved into the point of no return. And Laura said, that sounds very ominous. And he said, well, simply it's this. He said, once he is in that crevice, the only way out is up. Because he said, he cannot negotiate his way back down. It's far too difficult. <clears throat> he saw what he was going to accomplish. He knew it. He believed it. He had every faith in it. There wasn't a scintilla of doubt in his mind that he was going to end up on top of that mountain. We might say he dreamed it. Because what we believe, what we see, what we feel, that is what we have faith in, that is not yet physically evident, we're dreaming. It's a dream. We are all dreamers. Do you 
think that Alex Honnold's dreams are important to him? Oh, yeah. Are your dreams important to you? Do you have your present dreams clearly in mind? You see, I know that you dream. I know that every person in here dreams. Every child dreams. Every child dreams. And as we mature, there may be times that we lose sight of our dreams. There may be those times in our life where we actually stop dreaming. And I'm not talking about the dreams you have when you're sleeping. No. I'm talking about your waking dream. What it is you want to do and be in this world. Because we are here to do more than simply be. If that were the case, most of us, and, and you can do this if you choose, and I wouldn't judge you wrongly. Not my business. <coughs> You can go sit in a cave and meditate alone for the rest of your days. And some people do that. And again, no judgment. But here's what I know. Most of us were called here to be in relationship with one another. Most of us were called here to, to have dreams and to share those dreams with others. And so we need one another. And if we stop dreaming, we lose our connection with the divine. We are here to be cre divinely creative, divinely co-creative with one another. <clears throat> I submit that it is your dream that fuels your life. It is your dreams that fuel your life. You might think that what fuels your life are fruits and vegetables, bread, tofu. <laughs> Some of you know that I have eaten tofu since 1979 when I was uh, treated to a very special eight-course tofu dinner in, <laughs> in a 600-year-old Japanese inn. And I, I had my bill. <laughs> So you may think that you, that, that your life is fueled by, by those food sources. Or maybe not. Or maybe not. In May of last year, an 83-year-old yogi named Pralak Jani agreed to work with 30 Indian military doctors and medical staff. His claim was that he had lived the last seven decades without food or water. And so he agreed to go into an Indian military hospital in the West Indian province of Gujarat and to be observed in a room for two full weeks, at all times under surveillance of a group of 30 people that had cameras on him and closed circuit television. For two weeks, he didn't eat or drink anything or go to the bathroom. For two weeks. At the end of the two weeks, they examined him fully. He was absolutely the picture of health in every respect. And the neurologist on the team said, we have no idea how he survives. But as medical researchers, we must not shut our eyes to the possibility of energy sources other than calories. Because he is drawing on an energy source we do not know. <clears throat> what did Jesus say? I have food to eat that you do not know. It is what you dream what you have faith in that fuels your life, that impassions and empowers your life. Far more than <clears throat> food and drink we take in. What we've been looking at these last four weeks is how we manifest, how we create. 
we looked at the four steps of co-creation. The first step really is about dreaming. I didn't use that term four weeks ago. But it, the first step is to look within, to look at your heart, to see what it is that you love in this world. <clears throat> because it is what you love that you dream about. It is to look at what your dream as a unique child of God is. That's step one. The other three steps are absolutely necessary, but they mean nothing and can, can go nowhere without the dream. It begins with the dream. The second step is close to the dream. It's, it's the end result. It's what does the dream look like manifested in this world that we share? The third step is to begin to physically move in the direction of your dream. Physically move in the, in the direction of your dream. And you don't have to know every step. You don't have to know the whole way. Not even close. Don't get caught up in what Mike Dooley, the author of Manifesting Change, calls the curse of the hows. It's like, how am I ever going to do this? How am I going to get there? It's start to move in that direction. Take that first step in faith. Get moving. Get moving. You can make course corrections as often as you need or desire. But if you're not moving, nothing will happen. And the fourth step is trusting. It is trusting the universe. Trusting the universe. Something you can't see, taste, hear, feel, smell. Because we've, we've looked at, over the last several weeks, that's where all the power is. The power is in the unseen. Everything that is seen came out of the unseen. Everything. Where's the power? It's in the invisible. So we trust the universe in this moment, not tomorrow, not next week or next month or years from now, we trust the universe now, right now, here, to create a new manifestation in a new now. See, you can begin now moving in the direction of your dreams as we're sharing this time. The movement starts up here, then it comes through your hands and your feet. Jesus said, I work and my Father works. And it wasn't just about him. He was doing his work. He was living and dreaming his dream. He was physically moving in the direction of that dream. And he was trusting completely in the work of the Father, the work of the unseen, the work of God, to draw to him the necessary resources and tools and opportunities and people and relationships that he needed to live out his dream, to share his message. We continue that work, each one of us, here and now. 